Hello and welcome to this video, part of the, the wider Adobe Spark presentation, helping you to explore the whole notions of academic level sevenness. This video in particular will focus on the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education and the descriptors given there for level seven. To set the scene for this video, first of all, it's important for us to explore uh, the background to all of this. And the, the reason why I've started to develop this is because I'm often asked to speak to students who are transitioning from level six onto level seven modules or programs. And quite a few of them are wondering what the expectations are of them uh, to achieve successfully at level seven. Um, especially those who are new to this academic level. Obviously, you've heard of so many of the, the terms that we use, such as uh, critical analysis, synthesis, words like that, that that are often bandied around uh, within academia. And you may be familiar with them in relation to your level six studies, but now you need to ask yourself, how do they differ, especially as you're starting at this new level of um, academic level seven, which is at master's level. Um, many people say that they don't know what's expected of them and some may even feel thrown in at the deep end when they start their, their, their programmes. So it's really important to get a grip of this to understand exactly what it is that we mean whenever we're talking about this level sevenness. Um, especially for those who have done level six studies maybe a good few years ago and now they're returning to uh, professional studies maybe they're doing some cpd courses and now they want to top up or move into um, a master's uh, program so for quite a few of them they may be asking the questions how they move from their level six to level seven and what those differences are because it's really important, obviously, that you need to make the grade. It's not just a case that at level six, the pass mark is 40, and at level seven, it's now 50. It's looking at, well, what do you need to do to pass to get the 50s, or what do you need to do to get even higher when you're looking at the 60s, 70s, 80s, and above. Quite often with modules and programmes that I lead at level seven, I'll often start off with a prezi based on an inspirational aspect of learning. And so much of that prezi uh, is founded on the, the teachings of Griffiths and Burns in a really good book called Teaching Backwards. And there are six elements of their model that I wish to explore with you here. First of all, it's imperative to set high standards for yourself and the, uh, the studies that you're undertaking. It's gonna be really crucial that as you move from level six to level seven, um, that you set realistic expectations for yourself, acknowledge areas that you may find difficult, uh, especially if you've struggled with studies in the past or didn't quite achieve what you wanted to, and now you're setting out on this new pathway and you want to do your very best indeed. So what are the expectations you have of yourself and how are you going to communicate those with your peers on your courses um, and especially with your module or program leaders so that we can all work together on this journey on this journey um, to help you achieve the greatness that you want to set out to. So it's starting off with um, uh, setting those high expectations. It's also really important that we assess right at the beginning um, your particular starting points because it's crucial to know exactly why people have come into level studies. Some of you may see it as a natural progression from the studies you did at level six, your bachelor degree, and now you want to move into uh, further studies. Others may be doing it because there's a particular job or a post or a role that they want to uh, go for and it says as part of that role they're expected to have a master's degree qualification or some others may be doing it maybe reluctantly because their managers have pushed them into this and when they come into the classroom some of them come in sort of uh, uh, dragging their feet behind them uh, because they're quite reluctant to actually start doing these level seven studies and that's so understandable many of them may be fearful of this and especially if they had a tough time in studying in the past they may find that the whole notion of studying at a higher expected level something that's quite daunting for them 
So it's really important that we start off by looking at um, the, each and every individual learner's starting point. It's also important to define and demystify the destination. So when people say that they're signing up for a master's degree, um, a lot of them realise that they may have to do a substantial piece of work, such, such as a dissertation towards the end. And for many, they might have only experienced um, a dissertation as far as writing a literature review for their bachelor degree. So what's the difference now with the particular assignments that they have to do, the contribution to learning, the whole new aspects that they have to um, investigate and challenge for themselves, and the final production of whatever it is they're doing on specific modules and the programme as a whole. And obviously it's going to be key to look for evidence of their progression. It's no good waiting until somebody submits their final dissertation to realise that it's not up to standard. What do we mean by that standard? What is this level sevenness? But looking for proof that they're managing with the journey as they go along. And especially if individuals are struggling for whatever reason, um, being able to help and support and walk with each other on this journey. So it's great for the students to be able to be as open as possible with uh, teachers, with their module or program leaders, especially if they're struggling. Don't leave it till the end, but give evidence of how far you're going, where you're getting stuck at, and how we as teachers may be enabled to help you through that stuckness. And the next step of Griffiths and Burns looks at challenging, which they see at the heart of all these critical uh, studies, and here especially, as I'm showing you, uh, within relation to level seven. So being able to challenge and motivate each other, especially if people are feeling rather demotivated, or maybe they're stressed, they, they may consider that they have too much work to do at the moment, and especially for those who are doing their master's degree, postgraduate studies, um, as part of continuing professional development. So they may have a full-time job. Some may or may not have uh, protected study time. Uh, they, they may have uh, families and obviously lives outside of their studies. So some people find it really difficult to fit all of this in, especially when they're seeing the new challenges of whatever it is they're doing. So we must challenge to motivate people as well. And clearly that's um, imperative if somebody's struggling with that motivation. And the final element to look at is not just feedback, but feed forward. Not waiting just until students have got assignments in and we can feed back on how well they did, but obviously being able to encourage and inspire people to be able to move on, to do better. So there's a, a really good emphasis here on feed forward as well as feedback. At the University of Greenwich, we've got a particular mo motto which says, you said we did. And that's really um, essential here for feed forward. If students are finding it difficult for whatever reason, if they're struggling or finding their studies hard, or maybe they're reaching an, um, um, a plateau and they just feel as if they can't get off it or move anymore, or maybe some of them are finding it really difficult to grasp new concepts, whatever it is, by them giving us uh, ideas about this, telling us how, how hard they're finding it, then the onus is on us us as teachers to be able to do something about it. And there's another lovely little saying in Griffiths and Burns books, and maybe um, I don't remember the, the exact wording of this, but I'll try my best. It says that um, if the students can't learn the way you teach, you need to learn to teach the way they learn. And that's really imperative with feed forward. So if for any reason the students, as they move along their master's journey, are finding difficulties, they've got to be able to feed that back to us as often as possible so that we've got the opportunity to do something about it for them. So it's a two-way um, conversation going on here. They tell us things that we can help them, but also with us giving them feed forward ideas, how they can improve their studies so that they get much better feedback when they've completed.
And I've scanned this one in from one of my fridge magnets. Uh, it's really important to say to our students at level seven that you know, don't consider any question to be stupid. The number of people that may start a, uh, um, a question to us by saying, oh, I know this is going to sound really stupid, but, and then they'll still ask the question. No, if it's important for you, if you don't understand something, then it's not stupid at all. And it may be that the, the way we're teaching isn't understandable to you, or the way you're understanding isn't really the best fitting your academic level. So if, if ever you're struggling, if ever you're not too sure of something, always ask that question and forget the old saying about, I know this is going to sound stupid. So it's at this point I'll move over to the actual wordage within the QAA's document for level seven studies. I haven't used the whole of uh, what they say on these slides, but I've just picked out some key points of those. And I'm going to emphasize those, especially in relation to people who are doing postgraduate or master's degrees in um, health or health and social care. You'll have noticed from the Spark page that I like using fluorescent pens, and uh, um, that's especially for writing, uh, uh, writing assignments. If ever I'm doing assignments myself or um, encouraging others to do their assignments, I think it's really important to use uh, fluorescent pens to mark out the difference in expectations. And here I've just used two different colours. One of them is showing um, exactly how to be that postgraduate student and secondly, what it is uh, in application. So the first one, for example, says that the student is expected to have a systematic understanding. Okay, now every word matters. So it's not just an understanding of something, but a systematic understanding. And a systematic understanding of what? So that's what I've highlighted now in yellow. It's of knowledge. Then they're expected to have a critical awareness of what? Of current problems or new insights. Much, as, much of which is at or informed by the forefront of their academic discipline, their field of practice, or their area of professional practice. I can give you a really good example at the moment. I'm making this video in January of 2021, and obviously most of the UK, all of the UK, is on lockdown because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so many of our master's students, whatever projects they were intending to do before COVID struck, they're now adapting to show how COVID has had an impact on this. So um, it's being at the forefront of what people are studying. It's looking at new ways of exploring issues. And even when it comes to work-based change management projects, maybe that's what students are doing for their dissertations. It's acknowledging that well, we used to do things one way. Now we want to do it a different way. So how do you get people to move from um, a to Z. How do you get them to transition from where they were at the beginning? You do some study around that. You look at new ways of looking at all of this and exploring it and how to get them to move on. OK, so that's really, really important here. And then the next um, uh, section talks about having a comprehensive understanding. And when you look at the grading criteria for level seven, to pass at 50% may say that the student has an acceptable knowledge. But it's when you start looking at the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, that's when these other words are coming in. Comprehensive, substantial, all-encompassing. So it shows there are degrees of um, academic level sevenness going on here. Not just sufficient to pass, but how to excel in that. So pick out each and, each and every one of these words. So here it's talking about a comprehensive understanding of techniques applicable to their own uh, research or their area of scholarship. So it may be looking at problems in a new way. Or maybe they'll see that studies have been done on a particular theme or a topic within one field of practice, and now they're exploring it in a totally different field of practice. So that's where they're pushing these boundaries of new knowledge and understanding. The next section talks about originality in their application of knowledge. So as I've just said, it may be that studies have been done on a particular topic within a certain area of, of care, but now you're applying it to a totally different area. So that's where the new and the novel is coming in. 
and especially on developing um, a practical understanding. So many qualifications within health and social care are there to make people better. They're um, uh, supporting you as you want to enhance, develop, move on levels of practice and understanding. Okay, so whether you're using this for formal research or inquiry into specific areas of knowledge, what you're doing is you're taking that knowledge and reapplying it in new areas of care, maybe something new to your specific discipline or professional group. And it's really important for you to have a good um, conceptual understanding of the particular topic that you're studying. So on the uh, postgraduate courses, on the master's programmes, we do spend time looking at something called epistemology and ontology. So that's ways of knowing things and ways of being. And it's really important at these level seven studies that you start looking at things through different lens, through uh, uh, different ways of exploring. And that's where the various concepts of research methods and methodologies actually come in. Because part of the work that you're going to be doing may be to critically explore or critically evaluate the way that people have done things in the past. So a starting point could be to assess where are we with knowledge at the moment? How far have we gone? And were there any shortfalls in the ways that people explored things um, in the past or in different uh, fields of practice? So that's where you're bringing a new conceptual knowledge to explore something in a different way, pushing forward the scholarship of your own discipline. And that includes being able to develop or critique various methodologies. So say, for example, with so much work done in medicine, where um, randomized control trials are often seen as, um, as, as a preferred way to go, as a gold standard within that specific, uh, particular genre of research. But now you may be wanting to explore something, um, a particular element of research that's been done in the past. So you may not be uh, keen on the idea of doing randomized control trials, what you want to do is not so much count numbers of successes or failures about a particular thing, but maybe you want to explore how people feel about it. And here in these days of COVID, you know, th there may be enough studies to look at the different types of vaccines around and the best methods for giving the vaccination and how effective they're going to be. So it's not that you're trying to replicate those, but you might want to understand what it's like um, to receive the vaccine. Or how about somebody who refuses the vaccine? Or somebody who has nasty side effects of it? Or different messages about it? So what you're doing is taking an area of that um, study that's already been done and now you're bringing new dimensions in, critically exploring the methods, the ways people did it in the past and showing that you want to do it in other ways. And on this one now, look at the persona of the, the master's student. So typically it says that holders of the uh, um, qualification of a master's degree will be able to deal with complex issues, both systematically and creatively. And you'll notice um, there's a video later on the Spark page encouraging you to explore things from a mind mapping perspective and then taking a helicopter view over this. So when you're talking about being systematic and creative, what do those two terms mean in relation to your studies? Especially when you think back to earlier parts of your bachelor degree, maybe you were asked to describe certain things, maybe systems of the body or organs of the body, how do certain things work? So you're describing it back. Now you're moving on and that you have to be systematic, but and creative as well. That also means that um, the, the, the roles in which you're working, you are working at a level where there are expectations on you to be leading others. So whether that's giving peer support, um, uh, leading juniors, uh, heading up teams, contributing to your trusts, uh, committees and developments. You've got all these new ways in which you now as a professional are enhancing your professional status with your master's level studies. And that means that you will be called on to make judgments, maybe as you haven't in the past. And sometimes you have to make those judgments with, without knowing all the facts, but being as systematic and creative as you can in finding out as much as you can on which to base those judgments.
One of the huge differences between level seven and uh, level six is now on the emphasis for you to be able to disseminate uh, your learning. So looking at ways that you can share it with others. Hopefully you'll get the opportunities to publish. So maybe out of your dissertations or assignments, you might be writing up articles or book chapters, or maybe you'll stand up in conferences and present, or do poster presentations at conferences. So lots of ways for you to disseminate your learning to others. But especially when you consider the different types of audiences, you may be having to pass that message on to a lay audience, or you may be going to professional conferences or scientific conferences where the whole um, set of language uh, skills that you need may be very different indeed. So getting people to understand your message, whoever that audience is. And a great part of the level sevenness is your autonomy or developing autonomy um, in the way in which you study and actually look at the particular problems you're facing, explore systematic ways of overcoming these and being able to do something about it. So you're not being spoon, spoon fed all the time. You're becoming more and more autonomous practitioners within a learning environment. So there will be times where um, you go off and you find out these things for yourself. And that's where the feedback and feed forward really comes in, because it's great for you to share that learning with your colleagues, with your peers on the courses and your course leaders, so that you are able to share this learning, look at any pitfalls and look at how to move on from there. And it's really important, again, for that um, uh, autonomous practitioner to be able to look at ways that you can now um, implement tasks which are going to enhance your profession. OK, so whichever field of practice you're working in, your studies should be contributing to that field of practice and moving it on, helping it to develop. Hopefully the studies that you're doing as well will inspire you to carry on. I know people often talk about CPD. Um, my own preference is to talk about it as CPPD, continuing personal and professional development, that those two go hand in hand. And when we use phrases like lifelong learning, we don't want you just to do a course, and especially for people who do a course or a programme, and they say, that's it, I'm fed up, I don't want to do any more learning. The world in which we live, we've got to carry on learning. So we've got to be able to move on all the time. So it would be wonderful for us to think of our education provision as being something inspirational for you to motivate you to do more to improve practice. And finally here, it talks about developing new skills that will actually um, go hand in hand with your new level of learning. And those skills may be uh, particular research uh, software or dissemination techniques. So maybe you're new to Twitter or you're new to speaking at public conferences or you've never heard of something called in vivo and now you want to learn how to use that or SPSS all these different programs that can actually enable you to do your master's level studies so much better and give you a mastery over those IT uh, information technologies as well as the topic area that you're exploring. It's also important to consider what um, attributes you will have as a postgraduate student and for the particular clinical or professional level that you're working at. So here you'll see the emphasis on transferable skills necessary for your employment. And when you consider the different um, advancing practice roles, look how so many of them are actually requiring people now to have postgraduate qualifications or master's degrees. So you might think that you want to progress professionally and when you look at the specific jobs you want to go for, they are asking for these higher level studies. And again, when you look at these qualities and transferable skills, think of those not only in relation to your studies, but imagine those as part of your uh, part of your day job. Each of these are transferable across from the acad uh, from academia into your professional practice, and that shows you are working at a significantly higher level. Um, than, for example, somebody newly qualified and entering the profession with um, a bachelor's level qualification. And the QAA also expects people at master's level to be leaders in their professions, um, especially when you're considering working at 
um, senior levels where you may be the representative on a trust board or a panel, or maybe you attend professional meetings or interdisciplinary learning that you're sharing with others. So you will be pushing these boundaries by becoming more and more of a leader in the work, through the work that you're doing. And there's a great emphasis here on you being original as well. So it's not just a case you, that you're doing your postgraduate studies and you're writing tons and tons of essays on set titles. You will be encouraged to do different types of assignments, but to be able to explore how you can adapt those as best befitting uh, the, the professional practice that you actually work in. So there's lots of scope here for you to be quite original and unique in the work that you're studying. And so much of the research or inquiry that you do at master's level will be on trying to solve problems or to explore them, first of all, to explore them, to understand them in different ways and look at various types of solutions. So that's all part of your leadership persona. And that leadership persona actually goes right across then from academia into your sphere of employment. And if you just look at this slide, look at the requirements that you're taking with you from your studies into your role in professional practice. And imagine these being embedded into that job um, and the contribution that you will make to your profession and to the particular area or the field of practice that you're working in. The QAA also talks about um, five domains of mastery. And first of all, it's starting off with your knowledge and your understanding. So it's not just rote learning, it's not just learning to describe things. Think, think back to your earlier studies in your bachelor days that, that you had level four, five and six. So there's a different emphasis at each of those levels. Now it's not just to do with the knowledge that you have, but you have a good conceptual understanding of that knowledge as well. And it's no good just having knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, here, especially within health and social care, uh, there's a real reason, a real good reason for you to be able to apply that knowledge and understanding to your field of practice. So it's very much the practical application of your learning that's important throughout your studies. And a great ability you have here, of course, is to be able to lead others and to make judgments um, on behalf of others. So as a leader of a team, for example, or leading in your field of practice, you will be expected and called upon to make particular decisions and judgments uh, that now will impact on and affect others. And crucially, there's no point in studying level seven um, just for you to have the satisfaction of doing it at this particular level, because the whole ethos of level sevenness is that you can communicate it, you can disseminate this, you can get this out to others. Even when you're reading uh, some of your professional journals, look how people have written so many of their um, articles or book chapters in textbooks, for example, they've written them out of their level seven studies. So there is this obligation on you in many ways to get your learning and understanding, to take on board whatever skills you require to maximize this, but ultimately to be able to share that um, for the good of others. And with your knowledge and understanding, it's going to be really important that you look at ways of being original with this, not just repeating what's been said or done in the past, but looking at ways of applying new knowledge or applying knowledge in new fields of practice so that there is an originality um, expectation of you at master's level. Also looking at ways in which you can now help solve problems, especially in unfamiliar ways to you. So for those of you nervous about getting into level seven studies and you may be just dipping your toe in the water, yes, you know, by the end of this, you're going to jump right in because there are these expectations of you that it's not just learning about new knowledge, but how to apply that, and especially looking at ways of overcoming it. So say, for example, if you're doing a particular project which requires a change management, then you might find that some of the models of change management will actually focus on people called the gatekeepers. And it's really important to win those over. So supposing you want to do some research or inquiry about changing 
the way the practice is done in your uh, particular area. But you might find that some people are going to be resistant to this. So it's not just a case of you studying the topic and learning how to convince people to change. You might have to study equally as well on how to enable people to change because it could be that somebody's stuckness is what's going to prevent your project from actually taking off. So it's looking at, well, who are the gatekeepers and how are the ways in which you can win them over? So that's going to be really important as well. And taking all the new knowledge that you're gaining uh, from doing your programme, from undertaking your programme, and being able to apply that in ways that you can now make new decisions or judgments on particular, especially complex areas of care. And even talking about um, the various constituencies, another term you could use are, are the audiences. And you're taking that knowledge out and you're sharing it with other audiences. And those audiences can be quite different in their understanding or their approach to things. So if you are working in health and social care, you might say that you're doing something that's going to improve patient uh, benefit. You're doing something for the good of others. But how many people are going to be resistant to that change? So the language you use in relation to patients or clients may be totally different to fund managers or senior clinicians or the policy directors within your organisations. So there are all of these different audiences and you need to develop the skills on which to communicate and to win these over, uh, whoever they may be. And obviously, there's going to be a lot more to your level seven study than we actually provide to you in class or online, however you're studying with us at the moment. Even when you consider um, um, an average module of, say, 20 credits, from the QAA's perspective uh, and the way we apply it at our own university, one credit is worth 10 hours of learning. So a 20 credit module means that we as teachers think it's going to take you up to about 200 hours of study to be able to accomplish all of the outcomes from this particular module. Now, obviously, you don't get 200 hours of teaching from us. So, so much of that is going to be learning in your own time and in different ways. So it's not just the face to face that you're getting with us as teachers. Um, but it's going to be your own individual study, how you're applying this um, in different settings. It's going to include uh, studying for specific assignments or tasks or elements of the work you're doing. So there are lots of ways in which you can contribute and build up your learning. And that's what fulfills then the number of hours for the various credits that you're achieving. And finally, here are a few top tips, and some of them I pick up on later on the Spark page in a couple of videos down towards the end of the page. First of all, always talk to your module or program leader. If you're not too sure about something, ask questions. Even even when it comes to doing the assignments, if you're not too sure what the assignment guidelines are saying to you, always ask. Don't just go on and do something in case you're doing it wrong. So this has got to be a two-way conversation, a two-way dialogue between you and your programme leaders. Also, I know when looking at some of the module handbooks or programme handbooks, you might think it's really tedious to have to read through all of this information. And maybe you're just going to dip in and out every now and again. But it's really important that you do look at some of the intended learning outcomes for the course. What is this course or this module or this programme? What, what are the outcomes of this? What do you expect to achieve by the end of it? Because more often than not, the whole assignment is written in a way which will enable Able you to demonstrate the achievement of those outcomes. So you need to understand what are the outcomes expected of you in your particular modules or programs. Uh, again, you might want to use those fluorescent pens look, because when it comes to uh, looking at the assi uh, assignment guidelines, really important that you highlight everything you're expected to do. If they're asking you to uh, to write a, um, a dissertation and they say there are six chapters in this, then you must do six chapters. If you do four chapters, you haven't done what was asked of you. So I know it sounds really basic to say this, but do everything that you're expected to do. But then use another colour uh, pen to highlight all the academic indicator words at level seven. How are you expected to do this? So when you see words like 
critically analyse, draw um, implications, synthesise, or whatever terms are being used. These are the academic indicator terms that we've applied for level seven from the QAA in relation to your level of study. And my last little tip would be that you look at the grading criteria for your particular modules or programmes. Look at the grading criteria. Look what's expected of you to pass at 50%, but then look at the difference in words, the terminology, the academic indicator terms. Look what's required differently to get from 50 or in the 60s or the 70s or 80s and above. And when it's looking at words like substantial, comprehensive, highly analytical, these are the higher level ones that you can aim for. And especially if you t tell your module or program leaders, this is what you want to aim for and how can they help or assist you in achieving that. Okay, I hope this video has been okay for you. Thank you so much for listening.